Hello, Saddleback Physiology students. It's time for us to discuss PhysioX number six, which is cardiovascular dynamics. This PhysioX best represents information that you're learning from your vessels and hemodynamics lecture. <clears throat> In that lecture, you learn about Poissouillet's law. As always, you should read the introduction for each PhysioX as well as the introduction for each activity. In the introduction for this PhysioX, you learn about Poissouillet's law, which is shown here. Q, with a dot over it, represents blood flow rate. Please remember this is not a velocity. The units are milliliters per unit of time or liters per unit of time. It's volume per unit of time. P stands for pressure. R stands for radius. Notice it is to the fourth power. Then this N, Greek letter N, uh, represents viscosity and then length. In our first activity, we are going to notice the effect of blood vessel radius on blood flow rate. And because radius is to the power of four, you should know from this, the results from this activity, small changes in vessel radius will have profound impacts on blood flow rate. What system, what autonomic nervous system is typically in control of blood vessel radius? It is the sympathetic division. Please remember from both unit two and what you're un learning in unit three, that if sympathetic output increases, another way of saying that is sympathetic discharge, then there will be more epinephrine released onto blood vessels and this will lead to vasoconstriction of that blood vessel. If we want to have vasodilation, we need to have reduced sympathetic output, reduced sympathetic discharge. I'm going to go to the next slide and relate how blood vessel radius is going to impact blood flow rate using a picture. This picture is also described in the introduction for activity one. To understand why radius has such a pronounced effect on blood flow, consider the physical relationship between blood and the vessel wall. Blood in direct contact with the vessel wall flows relatively slowly because of the friction or drag between the blood and the lining of the vessel, shown here. So all of this blood here Let me erase there. In contrast, the blood in the center of the vessel flows more freely because it is not rubbing against the vessel wall. The free flowing blood in the middle of the vessel is called laminar flow. Now picture a fully constricted small radius vessel and a fully dilated large radius vessel. In the fully constricted vessel, proportionally more blood is in contact with the vessel wall and there is less laminar flow, significantly impeding the rate of blood flow in the fully constricted vessel relative to that in the fully dilated vessel. So notice in the center here, we have more flow rate and we see a, a parabolic flow rate, that kind of arching phenomenon. Down here you're seeing blood vessel length versus vessel diameter. So the diameter here is bigger than in this vessel and we're seeing a more pronounced parabole versus in the smaller diameter. If we go back to our equation our Poissouillet's equation and just focus on the radius and everything else is held constant. Flow related to radius only. We're going to see that as the radius doubles, so if radius let's say goes from one millimeter to two millimeters, 
in this picture, if we are going from one millimeter to two millimeters, I know it says centimeters, but we're going to use millimeters, what would happen to our blood flow? If radius goes from one to two, then we are going to see two to the power of four increase in flow rate. That means there will be a 16 fold increase in flow rate compared to when the radius said, say, was at one millimeter. Again, that was a doubling that I just demonstrated. If we see a doubling, then flow rate will go up 16 fold. What if we saw a tripling? What if vessel radius went from one millimeter to three millimeters? Then that tripling to the power of four would give us an 81 fold increase in blood flow rate. So now let's jump to our data for activity one. Please realize that viscosity would, was held constant, as was length and pressure. You should be cautioned not to copy the data from this picture. You are not being told in this video which edition of PhysioX is being used. Uh, so this might have been pulled from an older edition than what you're using now. Numbers will be slightly different. So I don't recommend copying them, but do understand the phenomenon would be the same from addition to addition. Let's just look at the doubling of the radius going from 1.5 millimeters to 3. That's a doubling. Our flow rate went from 4 milliliters per minute to about 64. Remember, I said if the vessel radius doubled, we would see a 16-fold increase in flow rate. 4 times 16 is a 64. What if we look at going from 2.5 to say, let me use a different color, let's say we go from 2.5 to 5. Care to guess what 16 times 30.7 is going to give us? I'm sure you have a calculator. 30.7 times 16. Again, it's a doubling going from 2.5 to 5. And again, we get about 491, a 16 fold increase in flow rate. What did your curve look like? when we did this experiment. Notice that we didn't just focus on doubling of the radius, did we? We went from 1.5 to 2 to 2.5 to 3 to 3.5. So on this picture, this graph, we're seeing all of our data plotted. And we have this J-shaped curve. This type of curve is an exponential curve. It represents that when radius doubled, just to use that as an example, going from one to two, for example, we had a 16 fold increase in blood flow rate. This is not a direct relationship. This is an exponential relationship. We see this J shaped curve. Now let's move on to activity two. In activity two, we were studying the effect of blood viscosity on blood flow rate. Let's look at our equation for Poissouillet's. We're going to keep everything in the numerator constant, and we're only looking at viscosity. What causes blood to become more viscous? Well, it's all of the components that you find dissolved in the watery compartment that we call plasma. It also is not just what's dissolved, but what is floating within that extracellular fluid, like our formed elements. And I'll remind you that our number one formed element are the red blood cells. Not only that, but red blood cells are our most numerous cell type. 
in our body. Roughly one quarter of your cells are red blood cells. So if we see a patient with polycythemia, more red blood cells, we're going to see that this is going to alter viscosity. So red blood cell count, more red blood cells, more viscous. Reduced red blood cell count, reduced viscosity. If we increase viscosity, we will have a reduced flow rate. Why is that? There is an inverse relationship. Flow is in the numerator and viscosity is in the denominator. There is an inverse relationship. So that goes to that question there. Let's look at our data. Again, we're holding radius constant, length is constant, so is pressure. And let's look at our viscosity. Let's look at doublings, shall we? If viscosity goes from one to two, if we double the viscosity, notice the inverse relationship with flow rate. Our flow rate has been cut in half, so it's been reduced by half. A doubling here will lead to a reduction of flow rate by half. Let's go from 2 to 4. Again, we see our flow rate reduced in half. Let's go from 4 to 8. Again, we see our flow rate reduced by half. So that's an inverse relationship and it's an inverse linear relationship. Yet why does this curve look J-shaped like it looked with the radius example? It's because they plotted, Physio X, plotted every single change in our viscosity experiment. But if we only went from one to two, two to four, four to eight, let's see what that would look like. One to two, two to four, and four to eight. And if we could actually have this, like uh, expand the graph, it would look more linear. It would look more like this, an inverse linear relationship. So again, let me plot that another way. Actually, I'm just going to leave it like that as my line drawn. It is an inverse linear relationship. Now let's move on to activity three, studying the effect of blood vessel length on blood flow rate. We already said that the um, changing the radius of a blood vessel would increase the amount of drag. Well, a longer blood vessel would mean more surface area, more friction, more drag, more opportunity for the red blood cells to drag across that internal surface, and that means an increase in resistance to blood flow. So where is the, the uh, length value in our Poissouillet's law? I'll remind you we're going to hold pressure constant and radius and viscosity. Notice that length is in the denominator. Again, we're going to see an inverse relationship, an inverse linear relationship. What will the effect be of increasing tube length on flow rate? Increasing length will reduce flow rate. It's an inverse relationship. If we double the tube length, we will cut flow rate in half. So let's look at our data. Again, radius is held constant. Viscosity is held constant. Pressure is held constant. Let's look at changing our length from 10 to 20 
to 40. Let's just look at doublings. At length 10 millimeters, we have a flow rate of 90.8 milliliters per minute. When we doubled the length, notice we cut the flow rate in half. When we doubled the length again, we cut the flow rate in half again. Yet again, it looks like we have an inverted J shape. That's because PhysioX plotted not just the doublings as I uh, referred to on slide nine, but also all the in-between values. So if we look at going from 10 to 20 to 40, we again see more of this direct inverse, I shouldn't say direct, we see more of this linear inverse relationship. Inverse linear relationship. In activity four, we're looking at blood pressure on blood flow rate. In Poissouillet's law, pressure and flow are directly related. They are both in the numerator. So what produces pressure in a closed circulatory system? The pressure is actually started by the heart, the pump. What can contribute to the pressure gradient in the system? vascular resistance, meaning how vasoconstricted versus vasodilated. For example, if your blood vessels are overly dilated, your blood pressure would go down. There isn't as much pressure being sustained on the blood within the vessels. We'll explore that more in just a moment. So what are we trying to model in this simulation by changing pressure only. We're going to hold everything else constant. Again, let me jump up a couple of slides. We're going to hold radius constant, viscosity and length. We're only going to see how pressure will alter flow rate. So let's look at our data, um, and then I'll go back and answer that question. We're holding radius, the same, viscosity is the same, length is the same, we're going to change pressure. So if pressure, let's just look at the doublings, from 25 to 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 200. When we go from 25, which is a flow rate of 35, to 50 millimeters of mercury, notice our volume, our, sorry, our flow rate doubled going from 50 to 100, again, our flow rate doubled. Going from 100 to 200, our flow rate doubled. This is a direct linear relationship. Our graph is sloping upward. It is a direct linear relationship. Let's go back and address these questions on this slide. As I said before, the pressure in the cardiovascular system that is uh, first initiated comes from the contraction of the heart, the force of the contraction. And the vascular resistance will contribute to the pressure gradient, the pressure difference between two ends of a blood vessel is the driving force behind blood flow through that vessel. That pressure difference is a pressure gradient. If the heart changes its force of contraction, the blood vessels need to be able to respond to the change in force. Large arteries close to the heart have more elastic tissue in their tunics, and they can accommodate that change. Remember, those are called elastic arteries. So what are we modeling when we change the pressure? We're modeling the force of inotropy. If our pressure goes up, think of the heart having a greater force of contraction. What will happen if we have a greater force of contraction and hence more pressure? If we double that pressure, we're going to double the flow rate. Let's go back to our data and look at that. We went from 25 to 50 to 100, 
to 200, and we see that our flow rate, in fact, doubled. Now let's go to PhysioX number five, the effect of blood vessel radius on pump activity. Let's ask ourselves, what is a normal heart rate? About 60 to 70 beats per minute. Relaxation and filling of heart chambers occurs during diastole, specifically during the TP segment, as you have learned in your EKG exams. When is there contraction and ejection of the blood during systole? And ejection of the blood from the heart comes from, of course, the ventricles. So this would be occurring shortly after the QRS complex. The amount of time that the heart is relaxed is, a, is a, one of the major factors that determines the volume of blood in the heart chambers at the end of filling. The amount of blood at the end of filling is called end diastolic volume and is usually about 120 milliliters. The volume of blood ejected by a single contraction is called stroke volume and it is about 70 milliliters. The volume remaining in a ventricle is called end systolic volume and it's about 50 milliliters. In your lecture, you learned that cardiac output can be determined in two different ways. Cardiac output can be, be, can be determined by multiplying heart rate, which is beats per minute, times stroke volume, which is milliliters per beat. It's an ML. And that gives us milliliters over minute. An output, a flow rate. Cardiac output is a flow rate. We also know from lecture that flow, cardiac output, is related to directly pressure and inversely to re resistance. Now let me solve, let me solve for pressure in this equation on the right. Pressure equals cardiac output. cardiac output times resistance. I can substitute heart rate and stroke volume for cardiac output. And that now means that pressure is related to heart rate times stroke volume and resistance. We are going to see in the following experiment that we are going to hold stroke volume constant. We're going to hold stroke volume constant. We're also going to hold pressure constant. So if pressure is held constant and we decrease resistance, we're going to see an increase in heart rate. Now what is the resistance? The resistance when we do this experiment, we're going to look at something called the right radius vessel. And it represents, when you look at your equipment used box for activity five, the right flow tube connecting the pump and the right beaker that simulates the aorta. So as resistance of the aorta <coughs> goes down, and how do we do that? We're going to vasodilate the aorta, we're going to see that heart rate is going to have to go up to keep pressure at a constant value. So again, let's look at our setup. This right tube, right flow tube radius is what we're going to be changing. We're going to be changing that right flow tube radius. And as we change that right flow tube radius, as we go from 3 to 3.5 to 4 to 4.5 to 5, 
we're going to see, we're going to keep the left flow tube constant, by the way. We're only going to change the right. So notice down here, we're going to keep stroke volume the same. We're going to keep our left flow tube radius the same. We're going to keep stroke volume the same. We're going to maintain pressure. And the question is, if radius goes down, what will heart rate have to do to maintain constant pressure? And if you look at your data, you might have seen that as we go from 3.0 milliliters to 3.5, to 4, to 4.5, to 5. Then we're going to see our pump rate, our heart rate, so that's heart rate, goes up. And as heart rate goes up to maintain that pressure, Of course, we're going to see flow rate goes up. Again, flow rate, flow rate is heart rate times stroke volume. And remember, the stroke volume is being held constant. So if we take our pump rate, our heart rate, times the stroke volume, which is 70, we're going to see our flow rate goes up. So we're going to see values like 6,607. So again, we're keeping, we're trying to keep pressure constant. We are keeping stroke volume constant. And the question is if the resistance in the vascular part of this closed circuit goes down, and that means we're vasodilating, and we have to maintain a constant pressure, then our pump rate is going to go up. That represents our heart rate. And this, of course, will lead to a greater flow rate. Flow rate is heart rate, pump rate, times stroke volume. And that was held constant. That stroke volume was 70 milliliters per beat. Now let's move on to activity six. In activity six, we were studying the effect of stroke volume on pump activity. What does that mean? Well. Now we are going to go back to our equation, cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. We are going to keep cardiac output, which is our flow, that's our Q with the dot over it, we're going to keep that constant. It's going to be about 5 liters per minute. Now what factors can affect stroke volume? And this was from your cardiac cycle uh, uh, lecture. Let's start with contractility. Contractility refers to the amount of calcium availability. If we have more calcium activated calcium release, more calcium means more removal of inhibition from troponin and tropomyosin and more opportunity for actin and myosin to interact, leading to more power stroking and a greater force of contraction. A greater force of contraction means a greater stroke volume. But what is preload referring to? Preload refers to how much filling has occurred of the ventricles. We think of the TP segment. We think of how long the ventricles have to rest and fill. We think of venous return. 
And again, this came from your cardiac cycle lecture. So more time for filling, more preload, and we get more of the Frank Starling mechanism. Which states within limits, the more stretching we have of the ventricles leads to less overlap of actin and myosin, which in turn will allow for more interaction between actin and myosin once the inhibition of troponin and tropomyosin have been removed. If the actin and myosin have more opportunity to form cross bridges and power stroking, then we're going to get a greater force of contraction. Afterload. What is afterload? So afterload refers to the resistance in the vascular system meaning the resistance in the systemic system if we're thinking about the left ventricle. It's the amount of force that the ventricles would have to produce to overcome the resistance and pressure that's already existing in the systemic circuit. So blood will only flow from high pressure to low. We've learned that. If, the, a, if a person has high blood pressure, that means higher pressure than normal in the systemic circuit, then there is a higher afterload, and the ventricles are going to have to generate a greater force of contraction to overcome that greater pressure just to get the straight, same stroke volume. Reducing the afterload means that the ventricles don't have to produce as great a force of contraction to get the same stroke volume. So those are key things that can affect stroke volume. Preload, contractility, and afterload. And we are going to see this again in the very next activity. So that's why I'm spending so much time talking about these three factors. Okay, so let's go back to the matter at hand. We're going to keep cardiac output the same, and we are going to change the stroke volume. If stroke volume goes up, and all we have to do is maintain about 5 liters per minute, then the heart rate can go down, and that means we're giving the heart a well-deserved break. So that means if it has longer to have a rest, it's going to have more filling it will lead to an increase in end diastolic volume. If there is an increase in end diastolic volume, in turn, there's going to be a greater force of contraction. Again, partly because of that Frank Starling mechanism. This explains why a person who has been doing a lot of cardiovascular training can have a very low resting heart rate. They have built up their cardiac muscle mass in a healthy way. They have remodeled their heart equally. The cardiocytes have grown wide as in height. And a greater heart mass that has remodeled in a healthy way can lead to a greater stroke volume. And in turn, this would reduce heart rate. Why? Go to your baroreceptor reflex arc. A greater muscle mass of the heart and a healthy remodeling greater muscle mass will lead to a more robust stroke volume. This will be detected as more stretch from the baroreceptors and they will fire more action potentials through cranial nerves 10 and 9 up to the medulla oblongata. In turn, the medulla oblongata will result in more parasympathetic outflow to the heart. That means a reduced heart rate. So let's look at our data. Again, our flow was held constant. So this is constant. And what we need to look at is this column for stroke volume. And this column for heart rate. As stroke volume doubled, What happened to heart rate basically was cut in half. 
Again, this reflects the benefits of good cardiovascular training, allowing your heart to remodel equally wide as in height for those cardiocytes. More muscle mass, more vigorous stroke volume due to the increased contractile force, and the resulting baroreceptor reflex arc would result in more parasympathetic outflow to the heart, reducing heart rate. Now, let's go to our final activity. Do you remember, I've already discussed preload, contractility, and afterload, and what they, re what they represent. Preload represents the time for resting, filling, and overall end diastolic volume. Contractility refers to the calcium availability, and decreased afterload means um, more vasodilation of the blood vessels outside of the heart in the systemic circuit. So let me tell you what you're looking at in your data for chart seven. We're going to do an initial experiment where we're going to get flow rate for a normal normal individual, and it's going to be about five liters per minute. In the very next experiment, we're going to have that person develop an aortic stenosis. I'll remind you that would be a valve that is difficult to open, difficult to get stroke volume out. And then we're going to do three sets of experiments where we change preload. What is our goal? Our goal is to find out how we can alter preload, contractility, and afterload in order to help this person with their aortic stenosis to get back toward their normal flow rate values. So we're going to, again, have a normal set of values. Then, poof, this person is going to have suddenly an aortic stenosis. Then we're going to do three experiments where we modify preload to see what we need to do to get that person back toward a normal five liters per minute flow rate. Then we're going to modify contractility three times to see what we could do there to get their flow rate back toward a normal flow rate. And then lastly, we're going to do three experiments where we test the afterload to see how we can modify that to get the person back toward a normal flow rate. So let me answer some of the questions here. We are going to modify these three ways to affect stroke volume to see which one has the greatest compensatory effect for bringing a decreased flow rate caused by a decreased flow tube radius. What is the decreased flow tube radius? That's going to represent our aortic stenotic valve. All right, so here is our left ventricle. This tube represents our aorta. And the pressure here on this right-sided beaker represents the blood pressure in the systemic circuit. So here's our pump pressure. That represents, again, the left ventricle. And this question says, what would happen if pump pressure and beaker pressure, this beaker over here, were the same? If there is no pressure difference, we are not going to have any flow we are not going to have any flow at all if there is no pressure difference between the left ventricle and systemic circuit. Again, the decreased flow tube radius here is going to represent an aortic stenotic valve. So let's look at our data. Let's look at our flow rate, that's important. And here is our radius on the right side. That's going to go from 3 to 2.5, and then it's held at 2.5 for all of these experiments. 
and that represents an aortic stenotic valve. And just to make a correction here, this should be increased contractility. It's a typo. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. We're keeping stroke volume the same, so we don't need to look at that. And what we're going to do now is look at what we have for flow rate for normal. That's our goal. We want to keep it at five, approximately five liters per minute. So this is in milliliters per minute. Okay, so now in this part here, we have our aortic stenosis, and we've dropped to about three liters per minute. All right, so with aortic stenosis, we went down to about three liters per minute. Now our goal is to modify preload contractility and afterload separately and see which of those three manipulations leads to the best compensation for aortic stenosis. Again, our goal is to get back toward as close as we can to five liters per minute. So first we went for increased preload. We use a different color for that. Here we go. So first we went after increased preload. What does that mean? More time for rest and filling, longer TP segment, greater end diastolic volume. And our left, if you look here, our left radius represents blood entering the left ventricle. Where is blood coming from if it's entering into the left atrium and ultimately the left ventricle? It's coming through from the pulmonary circuit. So if we allow more time for filling, more blood entering, more venous return also, that's what we're really manipulating here, more venous return. If we increase the radius, we're allowing more blood to return, right? Increasing the radi radius means decreased resistance, and that led to more flow rate. So notice, as we allowed more blood to return, venous return, from the pulmonary circuit, did our flow rate improve? Yes, when we went from 3 to 3.5, when we went from 3.5 to 4, when we went from 4 to 4.5. All three we helped improve to get back towards our normal 5 liters per minute. Now let's look at when we increased contractility. Again, all three of these we were increasing contractility. What does that mean? More calcium. More calcium activated calcium release. Are there drugs that we can give our patient to allow more calcium availability? Absolutely. By the way, all three of these manipulations are something we can do to help this person. That's why we are assessing all three. The challenge is which one is better. Okay, so here we have increased contractility, more calcium availability. That's what we're doing. So as we have or allow increased contractility, and what does that look like? It looks like over here, the pressure difference here. So we're seeing that we're going from 40 to 50 to 60 to 70. So I just want you to think of that as, instead of pressure difference, think of those as more calcium. That's what I want you to think of. Did it help our flow rate to go from about three liters per minute, a little bit higher, 
yep, to about four liters per minute, and we get very close to our five liters per minute. We're not exactly back to normal, but we're improving. In our last set of three experiments, we looked at altering the afterload. What does that represent? The blood pressure in the systemic circuit. Reduce the blood pressure in the person's systemic circuit. If we decrease blood pressure in the systemic circuit, then the ventricles, given the same force of contraction, given the same force of contraction, they are going, with the same stroke volume, notice that we're going to have an increase. Notice that we're going to have an increase in our flow rate. So now I want you to think of over here, this pressure difference, this pressure difference as representing the pressure in that right beaker going down. Okay. This more calcium that I highlighted in green here represents the pressure in the pump going up. Again, contractility, calcium availability. Okay, so don't let that column of pressure difference um, uh, confuse you. you. You need to understand what are where are we looking for this pressure difference. We're looking for the pressure difference between this pump beaker on the left side versus the systemic beaker on the right side. And notice that as we decreased that pressure for the beaker on the right side representing systemic blood pressure, we again improved the person's, wrong color, the person's cardiac output or flow rate. Now some of the questions in PhysioX can be, I would admit, misleading. And it says in one of your questions, which of these three modifications led to the best compensation? Well, that's very difficult to answer because notice that two of these compensations that we looked at, uh, compensatory mechanisms, led to the same improvement in flow rate. Um, in fact, all three of them helped improve the flow rate. Two of them were a little bit better, but not statistically significant. So I tell my students, I want you to know that manipulating all three of these compensatory mechanisms led to improvements. Now, clinically, it's difficult for us to cause vasodilation of the pulmonary veins, to cause increased preload um, uh, for the left ventricle. Um, what we can do is just give medications to allow more time for rest. That's what we're going to do. So more medications, time for rest. But in this, this experiment, we modified, or we simulated that, I should say, we simulated that by changing the size, the radius of the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary veins. That is not something we do. We're going to give medications to increase the resting time. I'll say that a different way. Meds to lower heart rate. Longer TP segment. More end diastolic volume. We also can give medications to increase the force of contraction. Now, there is a medication that you've already learned in the previous PhysioX called Digitalis. And digitalis leads to digitalis leads to negative chronotropy, positive inotropy, and it actually leads to more calcium availability, which I described in your PhysioX number six. So there's digitalis helping us with preload and contractility.
What about after load? Well, we can, if the person has high systemic blood pressure, we can target that through various blood pressure medications. For example, uh, you're going to learn in lecture unit four that we can give diuretics to reduce blood volume, and that in turn would reduce blood pressure. So we, we can use a combination of medications to help this person that has an aortic stenosis to get back towards a normal flow rate. That was a very lengthy PhysioX, but spot on, perfect, well executed. It was worth your time, and we do test on this heavily.